It's kind of annoying that I feel compelled to make a video debunking another video that's over four years old, but with three million views and counting, it's getting a bit out of hand. This video gets regularly shared on acoustics forums with people wondering why information in the video contradicts other things they've read online, and even worse, wondering why the panels in the video don't work. This video is to explain what's wrong with that video and how you can get decent results on a budget. The main hook of the video is that proper acoustic treatment is very expensive, and these DIY panels give you a similar result for a much lower cost. In reality, you can DIY enough panels to professionally treat an entire room for only about one to 200 US dollars. That might seem like a lot, but if you're making content, compare that to the cost of your camera, microphone, or lighting equipment. Even if you record on your phone, that phone is probably worth at least several hundred dollars. Still, I'll recommend some budget options that are less than $100 later on in this video, which are more than adequate for a room where you'll record your voice. Immediately at the start, the materials being recommended are very questionable. Obviously acoustics is important, and we'll come back to that, but that's not the only factor when you're hanging something on your wall. You also need to consider safety. Building materials need to meet certain fire safety qualifications. Those include not burning too fast or hot, and not producing too much smoke or toxic fumes while burning. Generally, random foam does not meet the second set of requirements. They tend to smolder and release a lot of smoke. That can make it hard to find the way out in case of a fire, and the fumes could straight up be the thing that kills you. In a less dramatic concern, low quality packaging foam tends to slowly disintegrate as it's not designed to hold up for long periods of time. At a minimum, that could mean shedding particles all over your floor. At the other end of the spectrum, there's evidence that when these particles are kicked up into the air and inhaled, they can be cancerous. That's the reason most acoustic panels, which use some sort of fibrous material like mineral wool, are covered with fabric. Theoretically though, ignoring those concerns, these materials could still be effective, acoustically speaking. Unfortunately, the test being used in this video is utterly ineffective. Again, I'll show you results with a proper test method later on in this video. When a sound hits a solid object, it generally does three things. It can bounce off the surface, which is reflection. It can travel through the object, which we call sound transmission. It can also be absorbed by the material, which is what we want. For a more sciencey explanation, absorption happens when a material offers frictional resistance to air movement, turning sound energy into heat. The fundamental issue with this test method, as you may have already noticed, is that it's not testing sound absorption, it's testing sound transmission. That is, the test is not measuring how much sound is reflected by the material rather than absorbed. A slab of concrete would beat every other material in this test, but it wouldn't improve the acoustics of your room. This fundamentally flawed test method is pretty much the cause of all the wrong conclusions in the rest of this video. The towels perform better than the foam because they have denser fibers, and thus way more. That makes them better at blocking sound, but it also means more sound will be reflected. Two towels perform better, but that's just because we're doubling the amount of mass. Thicker material does absorb better at lower frequencies, but generally the performance at higher frequencies is unchanged. The info on building frames for the material is actually fine and not a bad guide to follow. In my experience, the wood glue is unnecessary, but it's not going to hurt anything. As far as material to cover your panels goes, you definitely don't want to staple towels to the frame. Professional panels typically use acoustically transparent fabric. The reason is that fabric typically has a tighter weave than the absorption material behind it, so it can decrease the panel's performance at higher frequencies. You can buy acoustically transparent fabric from companies like Guilford of Maine, but it tends to be quite expensive. In non-COVID times, you can test regular fabric by blowing into a piece of it and feeling your breath with your hand on the other side. The more of your breath that travels through the fabric, the more transparent it is. The before and after test at the end is pretty useless. The clap test doesn't reveal any potential issues in the mid to lower frequencies, which can make a room boomy or boxy sounding. The panels do cut out the high frequency flutter echo, but literally any fabric, including t-shirts hung on the wall, could do that. I do need to throw in another quick section because DIY Perks decided to update their original acoustics video. While the newer video is much better overall, it's also much less popular and does still contain some misinformation. Like the last video, the guide on building frames is pretty good. The aluminum frame is an interesting idea. It could actually improve the performance of your panels slightly since it leaves the sides open, increasing the surface area that can absorb sound. The test method is slightly more practical than the one in the last video, at least if all you're recording is your own voice. 
The only problem is that most people don't have hearing that's well trained enough to spot potential issues. I've been doing this for five years and I would not trust myself to judge the effectiveness of material this way. The rest of the video is fine. Rock wool is a really popular material for building professional panels. The only thing I'll add is that you should definitely wear gloves and a mask while working with it. Like I said earlier, fibers kicked up can be inhaled and cause health problems. The fibers are also really rough and can scratch up your hands. So that's all my grievances with those two videos. Now I'll show you the proper way to approach things. We're going to assume the room we're treating is designed for vocal recording, so suitable for something like making YouTube videos or recording a podcast. If you want to do music production or sound design, you will need to deal with bass frequencies, which is something I won't cover. First, you need to test your room. For brevity's sake, I won't explain in detail how to get the measurements you need. Room EQ Wizard is a great tool to test your room, and it's free. There's lots of tutorials and guides online explaining how to use it. I recommend playing your test sound through a speaker placed where the human speaker will be, and recording the response with a microphone placed roughly where the recording mic would be, but at least a few feet away. You can use whatever mic you have, but preferably it should be a flat microphone designed for measurement. You can buy one for under $70, or you can substitute a small diaphragm condenser if you have one. Ideally omnidirectional, but again, whatever you have is fine, even your phone. There's lots of information you can get from a tool like Room EQ Wizard, but really all you need to worry about is the RT60 or decay time. This is how long it takes sound to die down as it's bouncing around your room. The decay time should be reasonably flat across the frequency range, a slight bump in the lower frequencies is normal and sometimes desirable. The decay time will be dependent on the volume of your room, and you can find charts online that tell you the ideal reverberation time for speech content based on the volume of your room. In general, you're looking at 200 to 300 milliseconds. If you're in a bedroom or living room, there might be enough sound absorption from furniture to already be in your target range. If not, you'll need to add absorbing panels. There are calculators online that can help you determine how much absorption you need. As for building panels, let's talk about how to properly test materials. First, I recommend just buying materials that are designed for acoustic purposes. They are materials that will be safe, laboratory tested for their acoustic performance, and generally are not that much more expensive than other random materials. Try to avoid buying anything that doesn't have a fire rating and listed absorption coefficients. Arlex and ATS Acoustics are two reliable brands I've used in treating my room. Owens Corning also sells mineral wool with acoustic ratings. For non-rated materials, wool batting is a solid substitute. It performs similar to rock and mineral wool, can be cheaper and more accessible depending on your area, and is fire safe. It's also a sustainable and all natural fiber if you're into that. Another solid alternative is curtains and drapery. Heavy curtains with multiple layers hanging at least a couple inches from the wall and with heavy pleating can actually be incredibly effective as sound absorbers. This solution is popular in major recording studios and many live venues. If you do want to test your own materials, the only practical way to do so is the tone burst method. To properly and fully test materials, you need an anechoic chamber. Without one, the tone burst method is the only effective way to test materials. This method does have a few flaws that I'll get into, but let's explain how the test works. Okay, so this test setup is known as the tone burst method, and this is the only way to appropriately test acoustic materials outside of laboratory conditions. Now there still are a lot of potential flaws with this type of approach, depending how you set it up, and we'll talk through some of those. But overall, it's very simple. We have a speaker over there, which is producing a tone. It's going to produce a tone at five different frequency points. We're going to test five different frequencies. It's going to hit this material, bounce off of it, and then I've got a mic over here and a mic over here. So this mic is capturing how much sound bounces off of the material. And then this mic over here is capturing how much sound goes through the material, the sound transmission. Uh, we can basically estimate the acoustic performance of this material. Now there's a few downsides of this approach. First, obviously we're outdoors, so there's quite a bit of background noise. So because of that, um, our tone that we're producing has to be quite a bit louder than the background noise, which it is. We're also going to test multiple times. So we're gonna test every frequency five times and average those out to get us a better picture uh, with less input from the background noise essentially. Another flaw of this method is that even though we have a wall right here blocking between our speaker and our microphone, there is still the potential for sound to wrap around and go directly to 
the microphone. This is especially true for lower frequencies, which more easily wrap around objects. So for that reason, this test method isn't really practical for very low frequencies. The lowest we're gonna test is 250, and even that arguably is too low of a frequency for this to really be an effective test method. The other issue is that, like pretty much any environment, there are objects around here that sound can bounce off of. The closest of those is the ground, which is about 43 inches below our speaker and our microphone. So based on that, uh, that's about seven-ish feet of extra distance to travel. So that means that it will take about seven milliseconds for sound to leave the speaker, bounce off of the floor, and bounce up to the microphone. So the reason it's called the tone burst method is our tone that we're testing is actually only going to last about five milliseconds. So we're actually testing over such a short amount of time that we're going to be testing before sound can bounce off of the floor and reach the microphone. So it's a very short, very fast test that's designed to only capture the sound that's bouncing off of our material. Uh, another thing that we can do is we can also kind of shave down and look at only the frequency range we're testing for each test. Again, that'll allow us to kind of narrow down the results and get a cleaner result. Uh, another thing I should point out, another potential flaw, is that because our microphone and our speaker are at an angle, we're actually testing the off-axis performance of these materials. The vast majority of materials, especially flat ones like this sound blanket, actually perform worse when you're off-axis. So because of that, that can kind of potentially color our results, but it's a pretty it's not a super wide angle, it's a pretty narrow angle, so we should be fine in terms of that. But other than that, it's pretty straightforward. Really, you wouldn't use this to publish information on the acoustics. Um, this is a very kind of DIY test method, but it does work and it is scientifically sound. Um, with this particular setup, you'll notice these microphones I'm using are Rode M5. Uh, cardioid microphones, um, and my speaker here is an Atom T5V. Those aren't the flattest, most transparent sounding microphones. Um, however, they are flat enough. I do actually have a perfectly flat measurement microphone, um, but I only have one of them, so I don't have a matched pair. I do have a matched pair of these Rode microphones. But they're small diaphragm condensers, so they should be fairly accurate. The main thing to keep in mind with this test is that this test is a valid way to test this material. However, it is only a valid way to compare different materials. So we can compare all the different materials we're testing, but we can't really, we shouldn't publish this information. We shouldn't take this information and go, this is the acoustic performance because these tests aren't that accurate. They're only useful for comparing different materials that we're testing on our own because there are limitations in terms of how flat our microphones are, how flat our speaker is, and of course, the background noise and environment. So this isn't a laboratory grade test, but it is a valid way to test materials if you don't have a laboratory and you're only comparing different materials. So we're gonna test a number of different materials. The first one you can see here is this is a moving blanket. Lots of people like to build uh, DIY vocal booths out of these, so I figured I'd include one. We're also gonna test four inch thick acoustic foam, two inch thick acoustic foam. Uh, I have some two inch thick uh, batting material that's designed for cushions and stuff, so we'll test that. I have towels. I have two different kinds of towels. I have a thicker kind of bath towel and a thinner uh, beach towel. And then we're also going to test a three-inch acoustic panel that I built out of rock bolts, so a DIY panel. And we'll compare all of those and see how they perform. Okay, so with the test done, let's look at the results. First, let's look at the actual acoustic materials. This graph is showing how much sound is reflected by the material. At one kilohertz and below, basically no sound is reflected. At two kilohertz, quite a bit of sound was reflected, which was unexpected, but it's nothing ridiculous. At four kilohertz, the foam panels didn't reflect any sound. The rock wool panel did, but that's because the material covering the panel isn't acoustically transparent. That doesn't matter since the panel was designed to treat low frequencies, but it does show that having acoustically transparent covering does matter for broadband absorption. If we look at the graph of the sound transmission, all of our panels effectively blocked the sound, meaning the sound wasn't just traveling straight through. If we look at the graphs for our DIY materials, things are all over the place. 
All of our materials reflected quite a bit of sound all across the frequency spectrum. The only exceptions were the moving blanket below 1 kHz and the folded bath towel and upholstery foam at 4 kHz. If we look at the sound transmission, you can see that the materials do block sound quite well, especially at higher frequencies, but that's because they're reflecting the sound, not absorbing it. With the upholstery foam, you can see that basically no sound was blocked at 4 kHz, meaning the excellent lack of reflected sound was simply due to sound traveling right through the material. I do want to point out that these DIY materials are absorbing some sound, and putting them on the walls would reduce the decay time of your room somewhat, but the materials designed for that purpose are dramatically better at it, meaning you would need far less material to get the same results. The DIY materials are also only effective in the highest frequency ranges, and their response in the mid-range and lower frequencies can be somewhat unpredictable, meaning hanging them all over your walls would drastically change the frequency response of your room. Basically, the point of this video is to illustrate that professional acoustic treatment isn't outrageously expensive compared to DIY solutions, and the professional solutions are dramatically more effective, meaning you'll need less material to cut down the echo in your space, and you'll retain a consistent room tone while doing so. Anyway, that's it for this video. A bit of a long one, but hopefully you liked it, and if so, definitely hit the like button. If not, feel free to hit the dislike button. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave those down in the comment section down below, and as always, if you want to see more videos like this one, definitely hit that subscribe button.